invite you to turn in your Bible this morning to 1 Peter chapter 4. We want to get right back to our study in 1 Peter after taking a week away last Sunday. And we are getting close to the end of the book. Isn't that amazing? And since we are getting close to the end of the book, I've decided that there's a couple of memory verses that I believe would be helpful for us to take away with us from our study. So in the bulletin on the right side at the bottom, uh, from time to time, sorry about that, from time to time I put memory verses in the bulletin, but uh, I want to highlight that I'm going to now for the next few weeks be putting memory verses from the book of 1 Peter from our study. Now the first one, you might look at that and say, wait a minute, we didn't get there yet. And you'd be right, we haven't got to chapter 5 verses 10 and 11, but in my studies, I find these two verses to really sum up the entirety of the first epistle of Peter. First Peter 5, 10 and 11, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever, Amen. So let's take the next two weeks to learn these two verses together. I've printed them in the New King James. If, if you're more comfortable memorizing them in the King James, go right ahead and do that. But uh, I'll be memorizing in the New King James and invite you to memorize it in the New King James because we may want to take an opportunity to, to recite it together two weeks from today. If I remember, somebody remind me. So let's, uh, we'll work on some memory verses from our studies in 1st Peter. Now, did you find chapter 4? 1st Peter chapter 4, and we want to look at verses uh, 8 and 9 today. So I'll begin reading in verse 7 down through verse 11 so we could have the whole context of the thought. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. As we come to this part of the epistle of Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, we note that Peter says in verse 7 that the end of all things is at hand. Now I looked that up in the Greek, and what the Greek literally says is this, the end of all things is at hand. And it doesn't matter which translation, uh, if someone says something different, they translated it wrong. It literally says the end of all things is at hand. Now, why do I emphasize that? To be funny? No, to say it in a way that I trust, number one, you remember it. But number two, to emphasize it. Peter writes this first epistle, and the understanding that he wants to get across to the children of God is that we are getting closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the rapture. And that event will then begin uh, motion, it will set in motion the events that we read about in the Old Testament prophets, in the New Testament, Gospels, and very especially in the book of Revelation, the judgment of God upon the nation of Israel and upon all mankind on this earth and it will culminate in the return of Jesus Christ where he will set foot on earth again. Think about it. Jesus is going to set foot on earth again. It's really going to happen. I'm proclaiming it to you because the word of God says so. It is the truth of God. And when Jesus Christ returns, he's not coming the way he did in his first coming, lowly, riding on a donkey, submitting himself to the hands of wicked men. When Jesus Christ returns, he's coming in great power and glory as the King of kings and Lord of lords, he's going to bear the sword of God and he's going to bring down all the unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. Jesus Christ is coming again. 
Peter has that in mind throughout this epistle. Here in verse 7, he says, The end of all things is at hand. It means it's literally drawing closer every day. It's getting nearer, getting nearer. So we must be ready. All that we do as a child of God should be motivated by this truth. That's why Peter puts it here. And, and we should be listening, you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ today, for the trumpet sound. We must be listening for the trumpet sound and the shout. And, and we should be looking for when we shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Jesus Christ may come today. Would that be a glad day for you? Jesus may come today. Glad day, glad day, and I would see my friend. Trials and troubles would end if Jesus should come today. Glad day, glad day, is it the crowning day? I'll live for today, nor anxious be. Jesus, my Lord, I soon shall see. Glad day, glad day, is it the crowning day? Will it be a glad day for you? What a blessing, Jesus. The end of all things is drawing near. So be serious. There's four, actually four admonitions that Peter gives here. Four admonitions. We've looked at the first one two weeks ago. It's to be serious and watchful in our prayers. We looked at that. The second one is that we are to have fervent love for one another. The third admonition is we are to be hospitable to one another. And then the fourth admonition in verse 10 and 11 is we are to minister to one another. See how there's a great emphasis on how we should then live God wants us to interact together as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he calls it out specifically. Your prayer life. Now, that's personal. That's very personal, your prayer life. Be watchful and be serious in your prayers. And then the next three are corporate. Believers together in the local assembly uh, and, and to the greater assembly, the body of Christ. We're to be we're showing God's love fervently to one another. We're to be hospitable to one another. And we are to minister to one another. And it's appropriate that we finally made it here because we left our study on one another to get into First Peter. And now we're richly picking it up with these four thoughts. And, and when we do that, we're going to look today at being fervent for one, to one another and our love for one another and being hospitable to one another. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now, all these things, speaking about the history of the nation of Israel, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. That's the theme in the New Testament. We're here at the end. Some would say, Pastor, it's been 2,000 years. And they slip into this wrong kind of thinking. All things are going along, just as they were from the beginning. Some people say things are going along since Jesus rose again, and so they'll keep going along. I tell you, Jesus is coming again. In the end of all the ages, when he comes, this is a day of grace, and thank you, Lord, it has been almost 2,000 years. Praise God for that. But it's coming to an end. Jesus will return. How should we then live? Well, Here's four admonitions. We want to look at number two and number three in verses eight and nine. And permit me to take them in opposite order. I'm going to begin in verse nine and take the third admonition. Be hospitable to one another. The Greek word here means to be generous to your guests, to be kind to them. There are those who come into your home who are a guest there. They're not the regular inhabitants of your home. And, and we are called upon, we are admonished to be hospitable to them, to show generous kindness, generosity to them. But here, Peter is making it practical for the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, not just anyone and everyone, but especially within the household of the family of God, children of God. We're to show generosity. We're to show kindness to one another. This, this word for hospitality comes up three times in the New Testament. We have it here in 1 Peter 4, 9, but it also appears in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and also in Titus chapter 1, verse 8, where there it is a requirement for spiritual leaders in the local assembly 
overseers. They are to be hospitable. That's one of the ways that you know that they're qualified to be a leader in the assembly. Uh, they are showing generosity to the assembly, God's children. Well, here, it's for all believers, not just the spiritual leadership. Every single child of God is called upon to show generosity to other believers in Christ. And someone said, Pastor, I don't have anything that I can give to show. Oh, be careful. Be careful of that kind of thinking. Remember when the widow gave her two mites and Jesus said she gave more than all the others. They were casting into the treasury there at the temple and they were giving out of their riches. And it's so easy, the Pharisees were, they were wowed with the great gifts that people gave. Jesus was looking at them and saying, yeah, they could give a whole lot more. They should be giving a whole lot more. And this lady, she had nothing, just two mites, two lepta, and she gave them. And God says she gave everything she had. And this is the attitude. Don't look at how much or how little from your heart. Remember this. God loves a cheerful giver. And just give. God will bless it. God will bless it. Don't fall into the thinking, I don't have enough. I'm all, I can't make ends meet. I know Satan has got us in the rat race and we're bound up with all the pressures and the costs and things. Be careful. Give to the Lord richly, and God will bless you. He will bless. He will do it. We're to be generous, hospitable to one another. Now, very often what that means is providing things that people need. It's not always, it should be never limited to just money. You think of clothing, you, feed, you think of food, you think of a, a place of shelter. I mean, this is all-encompassing. We know today there's a whole industry. It's built on this concept it's the hospitality industry, and they provide lodging or food for people who are traveling because they're in need. That's the idea. When there are believers within the local assembly right here who are in need, God's people are to show hospitality. Be generous, be kind, and the way that we minister to one another. And notice now, ready? Now this is tough. Here it is. Verse 9, we're to be generous and kind to each other without grumbling. Without grumbling. Oh, well, it was a song written back in the 1980s. At least I used to sing it back then. Oh, they grumble on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Grumble on Wednesday too. Grumble on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Grumble the whole week through. God's children aren't to be grumblers. The word grumble means to murmur and it means to complain. That's what the nation of Israel did in the Old Testament. They murmured and they complained. Moses, why did you bring us out here into this wilderness? Where's the water? Where's the food? You brought us out here to die. When we murmur, when we complain, when we're grumblers, the truth is, we learn from the Old Testament, we're really just focusing on ourselves. That's where our focus is. When we grumble, we're just focusing on me. Why don't I? Why can't I? Where's my, 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 my? We're focused on ourselves when we grumble. That's what we are. We're complaining because we're focusing on ourselves. That's sin, you know. That's sin. Do you know what pride is? Pride is, is when you exalt yourself. That's what pride is. It's the sin of pride. And, and I will remind us this morning that that was the sin of the devil. Pride. That's what we do when we grumble is we focus on self and we're entering into a pride. But when we focus on others and we look at others, we have the opportunity to rejoice that we can meet someone's need. And what a privilege it is to sacrifice. I can't afford it, but I can't afford not to give it and have the joy of ministering to someone else's need. Praise the Lord. What a blessing it is to give to the needs of others, and to do it generously. And then you can rejoice instead of focusing on self and grumble, 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 grumble. You know, sometimes we're so clever. We can be so clever, we don't say it loud enough for anybody to hear. What was that? Nothing. Listen, God heard it. God heard it. You read it throughout the scriptures. Remember? Remember when Sarah laughed in the tent? God heard it. God heard it. You will read throughout the scriptures when people said that God heard it. God heard it. Don't grumble. God hears us. 
Look at others and focus on them to meet their needs and we can rejoice. Let, thirdly, when we focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, when we focus on him, we can experience the joy that we have done what God told us to do. And, and we're doing the will of God, 1 Peter 4, 2. We should no longer live the rest of our time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. When you give generously, when you help and minister to needs generously, then you can focus on the Lord. And, and I dare say the scriptures tell us in Colossians 3, 23, and whatsoever you do, do it as unto the Lord, heartily as unto the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that you will of the Lord receive the reward of the inheritance. God will reward and bless those who minister to one another. And, and, and when we focus on the Savior, we have that blessing. You'll get the blessing in your heart. I have, by God's grace, had the opportunity, and by his grace, I fulfilled the will of God in my life today. What a privilege. What a blessing. So don't focus on self. Focus on others and focus on the Lord. Philippians chapter 2 tells us, do all things, do all things without complaining and disputing, fighting and arguing and murmuring. No, we're to do it with a heart, a tender heart of thankfulness, a heart of willingness to be generous to others. Now let's look at just one example. Go with me to the Gospel of John chapter 12. And this particular example will draw to mind how we can focus on the Lord. When we show hospitality, we can focus on others, we can focus on the Lord, and we can gain great blessing from doing that. Notice in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 12, in the first three verses, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Well, by the way, at this point in the Gospel of John, Martha didn't go say, Lazarus, Lazarus, won't you come out here and help me? She learned a blessed lesson by this point. And here's Lazarus sitting at the table, and here's Martha. She's serving. Again, praising the Lord. She's rejoicing. And Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And then Mary, as you know, took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. She anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the room, the whole house, was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Wow. And, uh, of course, that got Judas upset. And Judas was that little nasty grumbler who started the spirit of grumbling and complaining. Why wasn't that sold? We could have made money and given it to the poor. Only takes one to be just a little bit of fly in the ointment. That's all it takes. And, and all the disciples sadly got into that. But here's Mary, Martha, and they're focused on who? Jesus. And what are they doing? They're serving him a meal. Isn't that practical? Throughout Jesus' earth, remember the Son of Man had no home to stay in. The birds, and Jesus said, have nests. The foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. There was opportunities throughout Jesus' earthly ministry for people to show hospitality, and it was a blessing for them. And Mary and Martha were just two of those who got in on the blessing richly. Well, you say, I, I can't have Jesus over to my home today, but remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25 and verses 37 through 40. Jesus said about the cup of water. Remember the cup of water in Matthew 25? He said, Lord, when were we naked and you clothed us? When were we hungry and you fed us or gave us the... Jesus said, in that you did it to the least of the one of these, my, my children. He said, you did it to me. You did it to me. And when we show hospitality, it's a blessed opportunity to do it as unto the Lord and, and to receive the blessing of knowing we have fulfilled the will of God, the admonition. What a blessing it is that God's children would be known where there is a place you can go and be taken care of, that you will not be left neglected. God's children will be hospitable to one another. Now listen, the end of the age is coming. The end of time is drawing near. Jesus is coming, so what should we do? Be hospitable, be hospitable. First Peter chapter four, we wanna go back now. And the second admonition, 
that Peter gives of the four is to have fervent love for one another. Fervent love for one another. Now, I left this one to be my second one I addressed today because the whole New Testament, well, the Old Testament too, is all about the love of God. And uh, I don't have enough years to preach on the love of God. So we'll look at it a little bit, though, this morning, and I pray get some encouragement as well as some, some blessing uh, of, of this admonition. Have fervent love for one another. You know the word. The word is, of course, agape. It's God's love. It's the love of Christ. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love that seeks the best and the object of the one who is loved. It may be very painful. It may be very costly. It was for the Lord Jesus. He looked down and he saw us in our sin and our need and he was willing to go to the cruel cross of pain and shame and he shed his blood and he died to pay for your sins. It was very costly. He gave his life. It was very painful as he endured the torture. He endured the death of the cross. As he endured the taunts of those critics who hated him and felt like they were having their moment, he endured it all. Most of all, he endured the interruption of fellowship between the Father and the beloved Son while your sins and mine were placed upon him while he hung on the cross there at Calvary. It was very costly, it was very painful, but it was a love that was focused on the needs and the best of the object love. He provided a full and free salvation for us. And that's the love of God. And, and notice what Peter says here in verse eight, above all things, have fervent love for one another. So if out of this list of four, we're gonna put one at the top, Peter puts loving one another fervently. Love one another fervently. That's chief. That's what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, isn't it? Now abide faith, hope, love. And which one's the greatest? Love. Love. The word of God puts God's love primary, chief. This is what we are to be known as, as those who show the love of Jesus Christ one to another. We've experienced the love of Christ through faith in him and have received his salvation, now he calls us as followers to show that love to one another. It's above all things. It's chief. It's primary. And uh, we, we are to do it fervently is the next word that comes up here in verse 8. Fervently. The idea of fervent here, this uh, Greek word means earnestly or without ceasing. I, I always like when I think of the word fervent, I like to think of a pot of boiling water. And because it's boiling, you don't turn it off. You just turn it on and leave it on it. Bubbling over. It's got an energy and excitement. And this word here carries with it. It's constant and it's energetic. May our love for one another be constant because we've been loved by God. And may our love for one another be energetic. Now these are important terms because we're living in a time where the world identifies love according to their own selfish desires. They do. Uh, there are people in situations who someone will tell them, I'm showing you love, so you should be grateful. And you think to yourself, well, <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> I'm not so sure. But our culture is so permeated by selfishness. It's, all, it's about me. This was convenient for me, so I did it for you. <laughs> this is what I wanted, so I got it for you. This is the way the world loves today. And by the way, if you don't want it, just leave it. I'll be glad to have it. And then this is what's going on in our culture all about us. It's a, a self-focused society. And aren't you thankful? <laughs> God's love focuses on the needs. And by the way, aren't you thankful that in 1 Corinthians 13, God defined it? so that we couldn't let our culture tarnish God's love in the assembly of God's saints. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Not for the world. That's as far as I'm going and you should be thankful I went that far. I don't know if you should have exerted yourself that much. But that's the way it is. But God defines love in 1 Corinthians 13 so that we would show his love. Now, there's not any one of us who can show that in and of our own self, can we? No. 
That's why Romans chapter 5, God has poured his love into our hearts by his spirit. And the fruit of the spirit begins with what? Love. Now, they're not fruits. The nine, the ninefold fruit, singular, of the spirit of God. In other words, when the spirit of God is uh, just showing forth his power in your life by bringing forth God's fruit, all of them, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. It's the cluster of the fruit of God. But number one on the list is God's love. God wants to show his love through us. And it's a very blessed thing when God's children are walking in the spirit and allowing the fruit of God's love to be just flowing through our lives, touching the lives of others for his glory. It's a blessed thing. We're told in, in, in the word of God, go back to chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Peter started this epistle by saying, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, that's a believer, through the spirit in sincere love. Did you see the spirit? Through the spirit. It's the Spirit of God bringing forth God's fruit in your life. Through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, that's a, that's a brotherly love. Now notice, love one another. That's the same word, agape. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. May it be genuine. May it be genuine. May it be from our hearts. And back in 1 Peter chapter 4, we again have another expression in this verse that we must look at together. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Love will cover a multitude of sins. And we have to look at this, and we have to look at this and understand it from the word of God, because you and I are living in a time where it's true of any age and every age, but we have come out of a time period where people in the name of love have hidden sins for the purpose of allowing those sins to multiply and be perpetrated. Wickedness. That is not what this verse is talking about. We'll look at it together. We don't cover sins so that those sins can be protected and that sinfulness can be protected and it can multiply and destroy lives. That's not what this verse is talking about, love covering a multitude of sins. But that's exactly the kind of thing that goes on. Some people say, oh, I didn't see that and, I, and we don't tell anyone. No, that's terrible. Sin should be exposed. First of all, number one, Peter here is quoting from Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. And Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Now this is an, a parallelism that's opposite. It's called an antithetic parallelism. And, but it's getting at the same truth by saying two opposite statements. Hatred stirs up strife. When there's hatred in the heart, people fight and argue. But when there's love in the heart, when we have our problems, we don't go to war over them. That's what the problem is saying, because there's an allowance for one another. So the verse here is really talking about when we have our failings and our, our weaknesses, when we have our differences. We don't go to war. We show a deference and a respect for one another that promotes harmony and unity. That's what Peter has in mind. He's quoting Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12. So uh, perish the idea that the Bible's talking about hiding sins. The Lord wants us to understand that Peter is really expressing this thought, quoting from Proverbs 10, 12, with the understanding that here in Peter's writing that sin is going to be dealt with. Why do you say that? Well, back to verse 1 of this chapter. Since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. He who has suffered in the flesh has what? Ceased from sin. Peter's saying love covers a multitude of sins with the understanding that sin has been dealt with in a righteous way. Not that we would hide sins and therefore protect some kind of a perpetrator wickedness. No. Sin needs to be exposed and called out for what it is. God does that. Now, it is true that when you have a personal sin in your private life, praise the Lord, he'll deal with you in a personal and a private way. Thank him for that. There's an exception to that 
spiritual leaders, we are called to a higher level of accountability. And when we sin, those sins need to be told to the assembly so that all may fear. We need to be careful. We need to be very, very careful. Sins that are open should be dealt with openly. And all sin should be dealt with. That's the idea here that's brought forth. Christ died for our sins. Thank you, Lord. There's forgiveness. How do we receive that forgiveness? God gives us two important words, and those words are confession and repentance. Confession and repentance. We've already looked at confession when we talked about verses 1 and 2. It's to say the same thing about my sin that God says about it. I did it, and it was wickedness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Love covering a multitude of sins includes confession. Know it. Repentance. Repentance is when you turn from your sin. That's another blessed biblical word. Proverbs 28, 13 warns us, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. You'll find mercy from the Lord. Uh, this expression is not said outside of the understanding that we deal with sin in a God-honoring way. We confess our sin and we turn from our sin. And, uh, and so sin, God's very serious about sin. No, let's go to James chapter 5 and we'll see a similar way of expressing this. Uh, the Word of God is speaking about delivering God's children from their sins and their faults. What do we mean by that? James chapter 5. Don't go back too far, you'll miss it. James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. James closes his epistle saying this, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and, you ready? Cover a multitude of sins cover a multitude. In other words, there's going to be a preserving of the child of God in the righteousness of God. Now, love is bold, and love turns to the one who's overtaken in a fault, and because love is spiritually mature, the Spirit of God is working in the life of the child of God, is walking in the Spirit, he comes alongside and is willing to restore another. Why? To, to turn them from the error of their way. To save a soul from death. To save a soul from death? Oh yes. First John chapter 5. There is a sin unto death. It is possible for the child of God to get so tangled up in sin and refuse to the prompting of the Spirit of God to work in their heart to get it right then the Lord God in his infinite sovereign wisdom calls that child home. That's possible. It happened to Ananias and Sapphira, didn't it, in Acts chapter 5? And there are other passages of Scripture. It's a serious thing. The child of God cannot dabble in sin. We must confess it and forsake it. And, and when we see a brother or sister in Christ who's struggling, we must come alongside and be a spiritual one to help and restore. Turn them away from their sin and in so doing cover over a multitude of sins. Uh, we want to find God's grace to help so that we can help God's children to walk in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And we want to honor him in helping one another to do that. Now, this is a, a side of love that get, gets a little bit difficult, doesn't it? It takes somebody who's, I quoted from Galatians 6 earlier when I talked about somebody who's spiritually mature, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one. Uh, it, it takes some real spiritual maturity that's willing to come alongside someone and help and encourage them and, and pray with them to expose and call out sin for what it is in a loving way. Remember this passage in 1 Peter is an expression of the love of Christ so that we can help God's children. And there are lots of God's children who need help. There's lots of God's children who sadly get themselves stuck get themselves turned off the path. And what a privilege it is to show God's love to those who need that kind of encouragement or help. 
And it takes a spiritual child of God to do it. And when someone has done wrong and they've confessed and they've forsaken their sin, then we should come alongside and forgive them and comfort them. This is important. Very often, there is found within the body of Christ an unforgiving spirit. And this is another sin, not to forgive those who have truly confessed and repented their sins. No, in Ephesians 4.32, we're told, be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. This lack of withholding our, our forgiveness, I should say, we are withholding it. This lack of giving our forgiveness is a cause of great trial and trouble. It's a cause of heartache and hurt in the body of Christ. Our basis of being in a relationship with God is he forgave us. And our basis for walking day by day in that blessedness of fellowship with God is when we confess our sins, he forgives us. Well, understand that that principle is also true in our fellowship together in the body of Christ. The fact when someone has done something wrong, and we all do, we all sin, when that one confesses their sin, then we need to forgive them and comfort them and embrace them because that's the basis for our fellowshipping with one another. If we withhold our forgiveness, then we are causing division in the body of Christ. And it's a terrible thing. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to show you a powerful illustration of this. That's not right. Hang on, I, I typed the wrong reference in my notes. Chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Thankfully, we weren't far. Notice this illustration in verses 6 through 8. Now, to get the context, you have to understand 1 Corinthians. Apparently, there was a man in the assembly, a believer, who was caught in gross immorality. Gross immorality. And it was so well known. This was not a private sin. It's not like I had some wrong thoughts and I went alone and got alone in prayer in the secret place and talked with God about it and confessed it and I moved on. This was not only known in the assembly, it was known in the public, this gross immorality that he was engaged in. And Paul addressed it. And he told them, by the way, discipline, church discipline. They were to be separated from the local assembly. And Paul writes about that. But wonderful truth. Apparently, when that first epistle came and the judgment that Paul passed and the willingness of the local assembly to fulfill the God-given responsibility of discipline in the local assembly, this man repented. He got it right. Because here we see in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians verses 6 through 8, Paul writes, this punishment was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. That's the discipline, the church discipline of treating him as an unbeliever, separating from him. Notice verse 7, so that on the contrary, you ought, ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. He got it right. He repented of his sin. And by the way, when you truly repent, if there's something you have to make right, you make it right. Years ago, when people got saved, do you know they got rid of the sinful things in their life? They got, when I was a young teenager, I'm, I must be getting older now because I'm repeating myself. I know I've said this before. When I was a young teenager in a local assembly, I saw people who got saved and they took their world's music and they smashed, they were records back then. They, they were cassette tapes too. But there were still LPs, you still can get them today, but they were much more popular still then. And they broke their records. They got rid of their alcohol. They got rid of their sinful relationships because they had a desire to get their life right. That's what this man did. When the instruction of righteousness came, he repented, and then the fruit of repentance followed. He got it right. 
And when he did, what was supposed to happen? The assembly is to forgive him and to show love to him that there may be comfort. We cannot be so foolish that we have an adversary, the devil, who uses believers who la refuse to forgive as a means by which he can attack the local assembly. We have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves to show that forgiveness when someone has repented and show that comfort and love to bring them back in. Do you see how this love covers a multitude of sins? It's going to work powerfully in the body of Christ to demonstrate God's love. God's love truly is chief. And it's a blessing when we show it to one another. We show the love of Christ that has been shown to us. And the love of God is truly the surpassing greatness of God's commands. And all the commands he gives to us in his holy word, this one is truly of the surpassing greatness in its scope and measure. Let's see that together. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. To love one another is first of all by the Lord Jesus Christ called out as the greatest commandment. Now, here in this context, of course, Jesus speaks about our love for God first, because that's chief. But the Lord Jesus Christ, in talking about the greatest commandment, puts loving one another right beside it when he talks about love your neighbor as yourself. In uh, Matthew chapter 22 and verse 34, he was asked the question by a lawyer, which is the greatest commandment? And he responded, verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second, notice these words, is like it. Is like it how? It's the greatest commandment. It's two parts of one. Here it is. What is it? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now Jesus is quoting here from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, but this statement appears at least three times in the book of Deuteronomy. To what? Love God with the entirety of your being. It's our greatest privilege to love God that way. And number two, to love our neighbor. Jesus put it right here beside our love for God. That's number two. So love, showing God's love to him and to one another is the greatest commandment, number one. Number two, it's the royal commandment. Go to James again, James chapter two. It's the greatest commandment, but it's also the royal commandment. James chapter two, what I want is verse eight, but I'm gonna begin reading in verse one because the context really helps here. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you would pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Very practical. Couldn't be more practical. But here, James calls that loving your neighbor as yourself, it's the royal law. It's the law of the king. And the king of kings says, I want you to love your neighbor in the same way that you show love to your own self. Everyone, Paul writes, uh, is careful about how we take care of ourselves. No one ever yet hated his own flesh, but we nourish it, cherish it. We care for ourselves. We care for our families. God, the king, wants to show that kind of love to our neighbor. Show that love. It's a royal commandment to love and to show the king's love. And when you do it in the way the scriptures say, in the same way that Christ loved me, 
you're honoring the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, showing a royal love. Notice, no partiality. No partiality here is accepted by God. It's easy to pick the ones we want to love, isn't it? Oh, you're in my little group. Of course I'll show you love. God hates that. God wants us to show that love to anyone and everyone. And, uh, and, and that's a challenge to our flesh. But remember what I said earlier? God pours his love into our hearts. Why? So that we may show his love to one another by his spirit who dwells within. Number one, it's the greatest command. Number two, it's a royal command. We show the king of kings when we show God's love to one another. But as you know, turn with me to John chapter 13. It's also the Savior's new command. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Now this really gets to the heart of a little bit of a distinction between the last two passages, the greatest command and the royal command, but it's also, it's our Savior's command. And Jesus put a very special emphasis on it for believers in this age. John 13, 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, here it is, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Lord Jesus Christ said, The way that I have loved you, that's now the way I want you to show love to your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Love for one another. And it becomes a hallmark. And listen, the world has seen so much hypocrisy in churches today. So much hypocrisy. So much partiality in churches today. The world has seen unforgiveness in churches today. It goes on and on and on. And sadly, the world doesn't even regard us anymore. Have you happened to notice that? Have you happened to notice that out there, they don't even care what goes on in churches anymore. It's almost a laughing stock. But I want to tell you, if there's a group of truly born-again believers who love the Lord Jesus Christ and understand that they have been set apart and they are dwelt by the Spirit of God and by God's grace, they want to show that same measure of love to one another that Jesus Christ has shown to them, I want to tell you, Whoever hears it and sees it will take notice because there's nothing like it anywhere. Nothing like the love that God has shown to us. What a privilege it is to show God's love to one another. It stretches us beyond ourselves. Jesus was willing to leave heaven's glory and become a man and go to the cross. And then he said, this is how I want you to love one another. And by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Well, how about it? It's the greatest command. It's the royal command. It's our loving Savior's command. May it be our practice to show God's love to one another. Lord, help us with this. He might be speaking to your heart. I know he's speaking to my heart. I know he's speaking to my heart. There isn't any one of us who can't look at our lives honestly and say, Lord, there really is some need in my heart for some increase in this area. By your grace, I want to be be that vessel in your hand that is truly filled with the Spirit of God so that you will love others through me. If God's speaking to our hearts today, don't let it go unaddressed. Find some time today to have an opportunity to talk with your Lord and allow God's love to vibrate in the local assembly such that he will work in a powerful way for his glory. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love because you have shown it toward us. And Father, we thank you. We see expressions of it all about us in the churches, in local assemblies, in ours. We thank you for it. And I pray that we would be open enough to allow the Spirit of God to work in our hearts that we might increase, that we might allow your Spirit to see our heart the way you see our heart that we might open ourselves up into your hands to grow in grace, to grow in such a way that we increase in our spiritual maturity, that we would be hospitable to one another, and that above all, we would show the love of Christ to one another, that truly, O oh Lord, you might receive all the glory. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close this morning, Let's turn in our living hymns hymnal to number four.